War in the Wind, The Battle for Atu Island, May 1943. This is a game published by Compass Games. It is not a new game, but I was looking at the website. I was looking for a simple uh, war game, and this seems to fit the bill. Also, it is about a topic that I did not know very well, and I know it better now. So that's also one of the reasons why we play historical war games. So we are in World War II and we are, well, on Atu Island. The Japanese have taken control of it. It is American soil, so the Americans want it back. However, what the Americans do not expect is the level of determination and preparedness that the Japanese defenders have. It's a completely non-symmetrical game in which the Japanese player will be playing a guerrilla game, basically, and the American player will have to do to deal with the fact that these uh, sneaky, easy uh, to miss units that move around fast, that do not have much of a bite when you get them in uh, direct confrontation, can actually inflict a lot of damage on you when they are in well defended positions which they will be most of the time. So a two-player game for the J Japanese side and American side, but it can also be played solitaire because there is hidden information on the Japanese side, and so you use those phase-down markers, then a two-player game, the Japanese player would know, you use them as randomizers, so you take the American side and you will have a lot of surprises as those uh, markers are then revealed and you know the kind of units that they actually represent. Let me show how the game works. The game is played on this paper map here, which is very functional, it may look a little drab at first, but actually that also fits the theme, as the weather in the game will be often rain and fog, and that's just, just it fits, shouldn't be maybe too colorful, too happy looking. Here we have several tables, very functional, so they're just right there when you need them as you're playing the game. The Japanese player will be defending the island. At the beginning of the game, the Japanese player will have several units scattered around the island, and many of those units will be represented by these tokens, which are unknown units. You should think of them not exactly as full military units yet, but mainly as blips on a raider because there might or may not be a unit there, or at least you don't know exactly uh, the strength of that unit. That token is revealed when attacked in melee by the Americans, or when it attacks in melee or with range, then you reveal it, and you look at the mini table printed on it, you roll a d10, and that tells you the number of steps that are to be found there, and so that is then replaced by units that are drawn from a random cup and then you place them there and the number of steps that you saw on that table also means number of units because all Japanese actual units uh, are one step if the unknown unit is eliminated in range combat by the Americans then it is removed without ever being revealed uh, you can imagine that those people just melted away in the jungle as for military units, uh, the actual military units, we have infantry, of course, we have artillery, and very important for the Americans, we have engineers. The factors that you see here are attack factor, range factor, and the small number is the actual range of the range attack, the distance up to which you can attack using range attacks, and then here we have movement. So you can see these artilleries, they land and then they just stay there. Up here we have the number of steps, so we have American units that are more than two steps. When a unit takes a hit, it is flipped to a side that shows a reduced step. When it has a, a three steps uh, label and it takes another hit, then you replace it with a corresponding uh, token, or a marker, with a corresponding counter that has a two step and one step on the other side. Engineer units are super important because supply lines are very hard, they're very short uh, for the American players. You need to trace them back to your beachheads, and so as you're going far there, far from there, and the supply lines are short, you cannot trace supply lines to the beachhead anymore, so you will trace it to, uh, to supply depots that the engineer units can build 
and those also you will need to have a chain because the supply depots can trace the supply to one another all the way going back to the beach uh, up to the movement distance uh, of an engineer unit so there will be six axes away not necessarily even clear terrain and this game is so hard for the american player it takes two movement points so in the best case scenario you have usually three three hexes away one exception is these rivers here that actually are the only area on the map where the american player can spend only one movement point so you can have longer supply lines but say if you want to go on this area of the map then you will definitely need to create chains of supply depots and you should then trace supply there logistics is such an important element in the game now uh, yeah, that would die. Uh, let me see. Then you could maybe do this and one, one, two, three, four, five, six, so one, two. Yeah, that would be, I think, in, that unit would be in supply. When I move further, more depots are in order, so it can be that tough. Now, speaking of, well, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do and where uh, are we trying to go? The American player starts off map and will land units in the landing zones. There are some here, then we have one there, and one up there, and one here. So as you can see, there are landing zones in that area of the map, and especially in this area of the map. You just have to walk there from pretty far. You will place your reinforcements uh, from the reinforcement box uh, into the staging areas so the staging areas this, uh, that are match landing zones so d when you want to land them there e when you want to land them there but then before they actually get there before you move them from there to the landing zone you roll on the scatter table and you see where you actually end up being which is not necessarily where you expected which may cause you to be overstacked which of course is a problem so oof, it's tough the map is divided by these thin red lines into sectors and each sector has an objective hex marked by a star. If there is an American unit controlling an objective sector and there are no non-unknown units in a sector, so there are only unknown units or no Japanese units at all, then the American player has cleared that sector now main Japanese units can still move into there by using their movement points but at least they cannot teleport because otherwise there is a phase in the game in which the Japanese player can, can pretty much teleport or relocate unknown units anywhere on the map as long as this is unclear sectors from an unclear sector to another to anywhere else that also is unclear so there is that you want to lock them, then it's harder for the Japanese player to take them. Otherwise, just in true, you know, good representation of true guerrilla warfare, these people just appear, disappear, show up somewhere else, and so on and so forth. What are we trying to do, by the way? Yes, the American player is trying to take control of the island, which is achieved by either clearing all sectors or by, the, by controlling all objectives hexes on the map or by removing all Japanese units from the map. The Japanese player is trying to prevent the American player from doing precisely so and wins if that is the case. Also the Japanese player can win by inflicting pretty much horrifying casualties on the Americans. The length of the game is variable and the Japanese player knows the length of the game and the American player doesn't. There's a procedure for that, but that is interesting because it puts more pressure on the American player. Now, now that we have some of the basics, uh, we'll look at the turn structure, which may feel convoluted, mainly because there are three types of possible turns. There is, and the American player decides which turn is declared, which kind of turn we are gonna play each turn. The simplest is the night turn, in which the uh, usually the Japanese player, um, uh, uh, whoop, yeah, the Japanese player goes first, and the Americans go next, and then also movement is reduced, so it can be a way for the American to slow things down if uh, the situation requires that. Then you have the main uh, action turn, and we'll talk about that. But very interesting, we had the refit turn in which the American player is taking care of logistics, but because of the lull in the battlefield, although the Japanese player gets an advantage there. 
always you need to determine the weather and the weather is just so bad which of course is good for the Japanese player and truly bad for the American player weather can be cloudy that's the best weather that you get rain fog or willow which I just learned about it in know this word which apparently is fog and high winds wow doesn't get any worse and the effects are that well, um, your action is reduced pretty much only in cloud you get to do all that you could. In rain you move more slowly, in fog you don't see as well and so it's uh, much harder to um, to use range attacks. In Willowa, range combat is prohibited and then you have penalties for pretty much anything. Now, you determine the weather, then if it's a refit turn, the American player will try to recover losses. So you keep track of how many casualties you take as the American player by using a marker on this track here. And then when you are refitting losses, you use this table. Suppose that I have, say, 15 casualties here during the refit turn. First, I move my casualty tracker down to zero, which is important because that also means that deprives the Japanese player of the chance of winning by inflicting a lot of, of damage. In fact, I should say, Japanese player wins not just by inflicting, but actually by having a number, a high number of casualties here. So the American player can bring that down to zero, but that also means you're slowing down. So when you bring it down to zero, you will get to refit possibly some of those losses. You look at this table, you cross-reference the number of losses that you sustain and you're removing from the casualty track. You cross-reference that with a, a roll of two ten-sided dice and you see how many of those steps you get to refit and also a step that you can reintegrate to reduce units. It can be other eliminated units that you bring back, uh, but again in the reinforcements first, staging then and to the island next. So very important, the refit turn allows the American player to remove casualties and possibly turn some of those into replacement. The American player can also, at that point, create independent units, which is when you can reduce a multi-step unit and turn that step that you reduced into an independent, into an independent unit, like so. Which is also super important because that is precisely that was a flying engineer. It is precisely when the engineers can be reduced to produce supply depots. Again, so important. So as you can see, the refit unit, there are games in which when you declare a refit turn or that kind of stuff, maybe you do it once per game. Here you have to do it fairly often. Maybe it's a turn every uh, two main turns and a refit or two, three main turns and a refit because yeah, otherwise you lose the game, it's just that simple. So the logistics really are super important here. By the way, during the refit turn, as the American player is doing all those logistic things, that is also when the Japanese player gets to hide their units, to flip them face down, gets to rearrange unknown units, again by teleporting them from one area to any other area which is uncleared and then you advance the turn marker. So that's for the refit decision. Summarizing, mainly you get, as American player, you uh, get reinforcements, you get to refit your losses, and as a Japanese player you get to hide units and relocate unknown units. Then we get, if your turn is the main turn, then it's fairly standard, sort of. Still the order of things is not necessarily universal like you have in so many other war games. Player one, which again in, in day turns is the American player. Player one will get to perform one action with each of their units. That means that a unit can perform an action and those actions are to, to move or to declare a range attack if you have the range and visibility or to declare a melee attack. And so that needs to be done if you were already adjacent to the target. Units that declare a melee attack receive this marker because during your phase you declare a melee attack but you do not resolve it just yet. So again, during your turn you declare melee attack, which unit you declare a melee attack or move or perform range attacks. 
And so again, moving and doing stuff is, is tough. When you resolve a range attack, well, you roll on the combat table, we'll look at that. When you perform a melee, the opponent gets a chance of attacking you first and then your survivors will, re will perform the melee. That means pretty much that in a case like this, the American player first goes and declares the melee, then the Japanese player goes and performs an action with, with, each, with each unit, and the action on that unit could be to shoot, to perform a range attack against the approaching American. The Americans then, during the melee phase, the Japanese player gets to attack first, and then finally the survivors get to attack. So the Americans, sure, they have great numerical values when you compare a 6 in melee to, say, a, a 1, or even infantry may just have a 1. Remember, they have a single step, so a single hit kills them, but those sixes may not be sixes anymore by the time they actually get to attack. And also, uh, then there are penalties based on terrain, a lot of other stuff. So it's bloody, it's bloody. And again, that mechanic really fits the theme. So basically, again, first player takes actions, second player performs actions, and then you resolve all the melee fights that have been declared. As for combat, you will look at this table to get the modifiers. You will roll here on this table. Uh, depending again on the on the modifiers, say if you attack from a higher if you attack in a higher level, minus two. Out of supply, it seems not bad, like it's not in other games where you get eliminated, but as the Americans being out of supply means that you get modifiers when it's already hard enough to attack. Weather is your enemy. And so you will total together all of the possible modifiers. Then you will roll a 10-sided die, and if the final result is 7 or higher, then you square hit against the opponent, and again, usually a single hit will eliminate a Japanese unit. This is the general idea. Continue like this, turn after turn, un until the end of the game is reached, or until one of the players meets the conditions for instant victory during the game. I like this game quite a bit. I find it very pleasant, very fun to play. For, for an historical war game, there's a certain almost depressing element to it, but that is to be expected given the theme. And so it's about destruction. It's about, of course, use of violence and material destruction for political purposes, because that is what war is. And maybe the fact that it's always raining, the fact that there is always fog, the fact that it's so hard to advance in that terrain, somehow increases the sense of, of dread, of oppression of the of the experience. I don't know, there are some war games which may be about the magnificent charge going down in a blaze of glory. There can be a certain excitement to them. This is a game that is still enjoyable to, to play. Mind you, it just has a certain somber tone to it, which actually fits the theme. And I also like it because it also shows us that war gaming may have one main topic, which is war, but it can really have a lot of different uh, flavors. The game is simple to play, it has some mechanics that maybe are not uh, universally shared by a lot of war games, so as, as a seasoned war gamer maybe you'll have to learn those, but the rulebook is still pretty short, you won't have any problem learning it. This is definitely a moderate, uh, moderate level of complexity game. It can be a great game for a beginner war gamer because you don't have to have another friend that plays war gaming war games. Maybe you're the first war gaming curious person among your circle of friends. You can play solo because it's soluble. You can learn it by yourself. You can play by yourself, no problem whatsoever. As for gameplay itself, again. It's really good. You have non-symmetrical gameplay, so if you're playing it against a human opponent, then you switch sides and you basically have different games. And both sides have very interesting challenges. As the Japanese player, it's not hard if you concentrate your forces to inflict some really terrifying units early on on the American player. But then if the American player spends some time refitting, then the American player can definitely come back. And uh, that also means that as the Japanese player, you need to be patient, don't be eager. It really is about slowing the Americans down, even if that means not inflicting a lot of casualties. Because 
it takes them a long time to the Americans to bring units back but they can still do it better than you the Japanese player can do so the same amount of losses even a much higher amount of American losses uh, is less of a problem for them than losses are for you and sometimes in a certain sense you're taking losses on purpose because you're tr you can transform a natural combat unit into an unknown unit and then maybe that unit is vaporized by an American attack or when you roll to determine it is not a particularly powerful unit what you get but that is what you need to do. You adjust, you adjust, you keep flexible, you respond, you move around. And again, the point is you're doing count, you're doing insurgency in a sense, without the, maybe a big political dimension, but there are insurgency tactics here. As a American player, moving is hard. Gosh, this really is a Clausewitzian game that shows you know, Clausewitz warned us that everything is in war is very simple. But the simplest thing is difficult because you're just moving on a map. How hard can that be? Terrifyingly hard when the terrain costs are so hard, when the supply lines are so short, where you constantly have to stop waiting for your engineer units to catch up and build chains of depots. Unless you do want to go out uh, um, out of supply and then you are uh, taking even more losses because you are well you're taking the same amounts of losses but you're achieving less so your losses are not as good of an investment as they would be if you're full in full supply and then you can inflict also some damage not just take it so it's a very very interesting situation i think it is depicted very well it seems to me uh, both sides have merit in terms of gameplay but the american side seems to be uh, more uniformly interesting to play because early on the American player will have to especially the early turns you're landing a lot of people and so the Japanese player kind of had to sit there it can be exciting to see where they end up being um, but uh, you don't get to do much in later phases of the game maybe there's like one or two turns left and you the Japanese player know it the American fears it but doesn't know that but physically materially you have one or two units on the map which may be enough to get you to win but it means that the last couple of turns while exciting in the bigger scheme in the bigger the bigger level don't give you much to do the american player is moving 20 30 units uh, building these depots and actually finally bringing their forces to bear and when it's your turn you have one or two or three units to move those turns are simply quick and and not maybe all that rewarding in terms of gameplay. It'll be rewarding because you see that your insurgency tactics worked because you're still in the game by the end of the game, you haven't been wiped out of the map, but still, but still, you don't get to do as much in the later phases of the game as the Japanese player. This being said, Overall, this is a really fun game. I'm glad I picked it up. I enjoyed playing it. It has, It is full of challenges, full of interesting decisions. It portrays logistics, which is something that not every war game does. Not, not every war game needs to do. Sometimes you want to upshot that and put the emphasis of the game somewhere else. But here it really fits the theme because, like they say in the, in the TV show, the Pacific the landscape is your enemies, not just the people that are hiding in the landscape. The weather, the landscape, the island is your enemy and the game really portrays that successfully. War in the Wind, a very enjoyable game. Somber and darker and darker maybe in the execution and in the pace than other war games, but definitely a good war game.